Good morning. I hope you're doing well with this extended stay-at-home -home protocol. I know it's gone on longer than a lot of us thought it might. And even with the state saying we're going to slowly begin opening up, it seems like it just can't come soon enough. And even with that, in the back of our minds, if you listen to the news, you're kind of wondering and worrying, is if we open too soon, are we going to have another outbreak? Is it going to come back again and maybe be even worse than it was before? If you're like me, you don't really like to listen to the news because for so long it seems to be that everything's just getting worse. It's a difficult time. The coronavirus just keeps growing. The curve of infection isn't, isn't dropping the way we want it to or flattening out. The death toll keeps rising. The number of, of people being out of work just is out of control. Unemployment numbers are crazy. The economy is crashing and everyone seems to be struggling with it. Still in the midst of this, there are bright spots. In our neighborhoods and in our communities and around the country, there are good things cropping up and happening in the midst of this crisis. One bright spot on the internet is this internet show called Some Good News with John Krasinski. <laughs> Tammy and I have really enjoyed this uh, comic look at what's going on in the world around us. If you've not seen it, I would encourage you to check it out. Just go to YouTube and put in Some Good News. It'll brighten your day. The thing that stuck with me, the thing that I like most about this, this whole program is the way that Krasinski ends each of his episodes with these words. Remember, no matter how hard things get, there is always good in the world. Now for a preacher, <laughs> for a believer in Jesus, these words resonate with the core of the gospel message. I want to highlight these words today, not because Krasinski said them, but because actually I think Jesus said them first. This is the heart of what the message of the gospel is all about. As Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That's the news I want to focus on this morning. That's the good news, the gospel. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for loving us and sustaining us even in this difficult time. Lord, help us to see the world around us through your eyes. Please empower us this morning to be reminded of how you lived and loved and made a difference for so many while you walked this world as Jesus. Help us to lean into Scripture and clearly see the example and actions you modeled for us so that we can be your people bringing good news to a hurting world. And Lord, even in the midst of our pain, struggle, and loss, help us to be faithful, to trust and follow you through the name of him who sustains us by the power of your Spirit, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, in the weeks and months following the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, this little band of believers who knew the truth of Christ and his victory over the powers of darkness struggled to carve out their place in this world. They became known as the Way, and they were first called Christians at Antioch, and they boldly shared the story of Jesus and how his death was the answer to humanity's pandemic of sin and self-abuse. Over the next 30 to 90 years, the Jesus movement grew rapidly, even under severe persecution. Eventually, letters were written to different churches around to encourage each other and hold them up and give them strength with all kinds of spiritual teaching. After some time, when eyewitnesses began to pass away or, or were martyred, and the second and third generations were taking up the torch of Christianity, writers began to put the life of Jesus into words, to write them down so that we would have a record, written record and we could get what we now call the Gospels in the New Testament. These Gospels were written for the benefit of those who believe. Oh, surely they were useful to tell the story to those who'd never heard the story before. But I think the first purpose was to encourage those who already believed to help them remember how Jesus lived and what he did prior to his death, burial, and resurrection to show us what kind of God life looks like. The Gospels offer this life of Jesus as a model to us as believers and a pattern of love and relationships that we are to follow. For the next four weeks, I want to take a look at, at four passages from the Gospel of Matthew and look at them through this, lens, through this lens, just as I believe they were written 
to encourage and strengthen those early believers in Jesus to follow the life and pattern of Christ, I believe that they are still good news for believers, for you and me today. The first passage we're looking at this morning comes from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we came to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for you, out of you, will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report it to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, And they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. There are three groups of people in this story. Each has a different implication for the original audience to whom Matthew is writing and to us. The first is Mary and Joseph. I have several questions I'd like to ponder about them. The second of the groups is the Magi themselves. What were Matthew's original gospel audience to make of these strange visitors, and and what does it say to us out of their visit and all these years later? The final group is King Herod and his religious leaders. They have yet another message for those of us who profess to believe. First of all, let's take a look at, at those questions about Mary and Joseph. This story seems to have taken place as much as two years after the birth of Jesus. The, the Magi don't show up as, as we've so conveniently seen in so many nativity stories on that night when Jesus is born, but they, they, they seem to come much later. And so I'm wondering, what is going on with Mary and Joseph? They, they're living with Jesus in a house in Bethlehem. What's going through their minds? What must have been happening with them as they lived there in this place? We really have no idea. We can only speculate what they must have been thinking, but did they know what their plans would be for the future or for this child? After all, they had heard from the angels, from the shepherds, and, and they'd, all, they'd seen all these things, and what did they think about what was going on with him? Were they filled with faith or with fear? Were they worried about the future, especially being so close to this tyrant, Herod? What was going through their minds? with all that they knew about who Jesus really was. Yet still, there's no way that they could completely guess or even comprehend what the future would hold. Then suddenly, here they are, boom, with these visitors. Not just any visitors, but foreigners. Well-educated, wealthy, perhaps even royalty. And here they are looking for Jesus so they can worship him, pay homage to him, to honor him as the rightful born king of the Jews. Now, what are Mary and Joseph thinking? My goodness, in case we thought we dreamed all of this, and we're not sure that this child is who we thought he was, guess what? He, here's another confirmation that there's something different about this child. That they, they had it right and when they believed God's word concerning Jesus. This is another confirmation for them But what about the Magi? We don't really know much about them. We don't know where they came from or or what was going on, except that they're not Jewish. And they traveled for some distance from a foreign land. They were stargazers. They were educated, apparently wealthy. And they may have been royalty. They had a keen interest in this newborn king of Israel. It seems strange, doesn't it, that they would come looking for Jesus, seeking out the newborn king, And yet here they are. 
Still, even with all of their wisdom and education, they're not able to pinpoint where he is. They couldn't find Jesus without the help of King Herod and his band of Jewish priests. Matthew makes it clear that their knowledge and insight could get them close to Jesus. They were on the right track, but they couldn't find him without the counsel of Scripture. The answer was only in the ancient words concerning the Messiah in the Jewish books of prophecy. Finally, we come to Herod and the experts in the scriptures. Apparently, they didn't have any trouble telling the Magi where they could find Jesus or where, where the Messiah was supposed to be born. <laughs> to think that he might be in Bethlehem never crossed their mind, but, but to think that he might exist bothered Herod. And all those around him were bothered by it. But to say where he was, if he existed, was easy. That was pretty clear. In Bethlehem of Judea. It seems the priest happily, happily gave this answer and then went right back to their business in Jerusalem. Herod sent the Magi on a mission to find this would-be king and report back to him so he could deal with him later. Here's the great irony. Herod and the priests should have been the ones who were calling the world to come see the Messiah, to find him and follow him. <laughs> but here come these foreigners traveling in, asking for guidance about where he might be. And those who know what the scriptures say don't even take the opportunity to go see if this great prophecy that they know so well might have actually come true. Well, Matthew's the only gospel writer who tells us this story. Why is that? I think he's writing this story because he knows that his readers, these first century believers, can relate to Joseph and Mary. Perhaps they too need to be reminded that the truth that they believed about Jesus was a truth that the world would want to know and would go seeking for if they knew it existed. This story is a great encouragement. Our King, Jesus, God in the flesh, the true Lord of the world is ruler and, and a leader that the outside world will come seeking if they only knew he existed and knew the difference he could make in their lives. Caneo Church, I believe this is something we all know well, but it's also something we far too easily forget. Now that's not a guilt trip. I don't mean to put anybody down. It's just a reminder of how life can cloud our perceptions. Mary and Joseph were likely very blessed by the seekers coming to see Jesus. It probably emboldened them to, to carry on and do what God was calling them to do. This story very likely emboldened the first century believers when they heard it, that the Magi came and the first believers were lifted up as Matthew gave it to them. It should also embolden us to build on and hold on and live faithfully to the faith that we hold looking for those in the world around us who we can touch and call and who are looking for something more, the kind of more that only Jesus can give. A second powerful lesson from this story is that we should not underestimate the incredible power and importance of Scripture. The Magi got close to Jesus but would not have found him if they'd not consulted Herod, who then consulted his priests who consulted the Scripture. Make no mistake about it, what Matthew is pointing out is that the wisdom of God has revealed, been revealed to those who will see it if they look in the Word of God. When the priests told them that the child will be born in Bethlehem, they went directly without hesitating. And then God led them by the star to the very house where Jesus was. These priests don't seem to have taken the scripture all that seriously, but the Magi did, and that made all the difference in the world. So what is the big lesson for us during this epic COVID-19 pandemic? Well, I don't think the answer is to stand on the street corner banging a drum and screaming the name of Jesus. <laughs> that's not a method that's likely to reach anyone in our world right now. They've heard the name of Jesus used in all kinds of ways far too much for far too long. What they need is not so much the word of Jesus, but they need some actions of Jesus. They need to see good things happening. They need to see how the life and example of Jesus lived out makes a difference in the world around us. 
and what's going to make a difference today. I think it's to live out the kinds of acts of kindness and compassion that are being highlighted on the program Some Good News on YouTube. Then when those around us notice and join in, we just keep doing those kinds of good things and begin to build relationships. And when the world around us sees the difference that we're making, they'll give us the chance to tell them the ultimate reason behind our actions. From us, from believers, these actions are not random acts of kindness. Rather, they're radical acts of obedience. They're intentional actions following the pattern of Christ. Let's get busy doing the kinds of things that show love and kindness to the world around us, to those who would be looking for it if they only knew it existed. We're a creative people, Conejo. God has blessed you with all kinds of creativity and good ideas for touching our community in positive ways. I want to encourage you, for whatever time is left in this pandemic, to brainstorm and dream of ways that we can do good, that we can reach out and touch those around us. Then pray that those acts in the world are done in such a way that people will come wanting to walk with us and wanting to learn to do things with us. Just like the Magi came looking for something saying, there's something about this child I want to know. And then they'll find that the only true reason that we are doing these things is because the most powerful gift we can give is relationship with God. Acts of kindness can pave the way to do that. So this week, I want to encourage you to get busy doing good. Come up with ways to be a blessing and to share those ideas, maybe on the Kaneo Family Facebook page and call us all to join you, or send your ideas to the church office, or challenge those around you in your small group to join you and get busy doing some things. I want to give a word of caution, though. We're not really looking for you to send information or ideas to the, the office so we can say, hey, church staff, you should get this going and you should do this. We're not really looking for more things for us to do, but we'd love to join you in what you want to do. We also don't want you to write to the church office and say, here's something the church should be doing. No, we want you to say, here's something I'm doing. And an idea I have, I'd like to get some help getting off the ground. I, I guess there's one more word of caution. You might try something and it might not work. I mean, I did that this week. You know, I, I've been seeing in different places online and, and different uh, places where people are, are taking rocks and writing little cool messages and putting them around a the neighborhood and it's brightening up the place and making it good. I've noticed that a lot more people are kind of walking in the evenings through our neighborhood than have ever been before. While I'm out working on the yard, I've, I've been able to talk to and connect with a lot of people who, who love our dog or who stop for one reason or another. And I thought, hey, you know, here's an opportunity. Let's do something good. So I made this great sign on our fence that says, rock the neighborhood. And then a little brief paragraph that says, take a rock below and, and decorate it and put it around the yard. Write some kind of happy message or some kind of good uh, thing or draw a picture on this rock and put them around the neighborhood. Let's brighten up the neighborhood with these colored little rocks. And I put out two nice buckets of rocks. And in the first day or two that those were sitting out there, there were several people, maybe maybe three or four, that stopped by and said, hey, this is the coolest thing I've seen. And one lady said, I love this. I got those rocks all over my backyard. Can I take a picture of this? I'm going to tell everybody about it. And I thought, oh, this is great. We're having a good thing going around our neighborhood. Then the next morning I walked out. The sign's there. The rocks are gone. Both my buckets are gone. And nothing has ever come back. <laughs> Somebody took my buckets. Now, I don't know if they misunderstood or, or maybe they took the buckets and they're just waiting to finish all the rocks and they'll bring them back all directed I, I, or, you know, decorated. I, I, I hope so. But maybe somebody just took my buckets. <laughs> so I'm not sure that that one's worked out that great. But don't worry about whether it's going to work or not. Let's get some good ideas going and let's start doing some radical acts of obedience, following the life of Jesus, making a difference in the people around us so that like the Magi who came looking for this Savior, people will come to us saying, I want to do what you're doing. And eventually, why are we doing this? And we can tell them the ultimate reason. May you be blessed this week. May you live in such a way that you make a difference in the world around you. And may God see you as his hands and feet.